Oh man, well, I hope it's a beautiful morning for everyone else. It's really pretty here so far, which is awesome. But, um, so last week was pretty short. I think I only went like 20 minutes because this chapter was like really short. But I did as much as I could, you know, in that little, that little chapter. So I thought it was really powerful. And last week we talked about uh, what is potential. And this week we are in chapter 4 of Miles Monroe's book, Releasing Your Potential. And it's called, the chapter 4 is How to Release Your Potential. So we start off, it says, Rob the grave of the potential you carry within. Release your potential. So, to understand what potential is and the tremendous responsibility you have to release your potential, in this chapter, we're going to be talking about six basic principles that are fundamental to all potential, as well as ten requirements that are keys to effective use of that potential. So, before you can even begin to grasp the nature and magnitude of your potential, you have to understand the laws that control all potential. God set these laws when he tapped his creative abilities to make visible that which existed but was visible. And the first two chapters of the Bible tell the story of this unleashing of God's potential. So, principle number one says, what God speaks to is the source for what he creates. So, when we go to the process of God, use that that God used to create the world that reveals everything God created, what was brought forth by his spoken word, right? When God wanted plants, he spoke to the dirt. He spoke to the dirt in Genesis 1, 11 through 12. When God wanted animals, he spoke to the ground. This is Genesis 1, 24 to 25. When God wanted fish, he spoke to the waters. This is in Genesis 1, 20 through 21. And when God wanted stars, he spoke to the gases and heavens. Genesis 1, 14 through 15, right? So throughout creation, whatever God spoke to became the source from what which created thing came. So throughout creation, whatever God spoke to became the source from which created thing became. And exactly what God spoke came forth from that substance to which he spoke. So whatever he spoke to came into being, right? Like we said, he spoke to the dirt. He, plants came forth. When he wanted animals, he spoke to the ground. When he wanted fish, he spoke to the water. And when he wanted the stars, he spoke to the gases and heavens, right? And principle number two, it says, All things have the same components and essence as the source from which they came. The source to which God spoke during the creative process also becomes the final home of all he has created. So when God's creation die, they return to the source from which he took them. Thus, plants come from the dirt and return to the dirt, right? Animals also came from and returned to the ground. Fish came from and returned to the sea. And stars came from and returned to the gases of the heavens. So this is possible because all things are made of the same stuff from which they came. So if we take a part of a plant or an animal and look at its cells beneath the microscope... We discover that plants and animals are 100% dirt. They are composed of dirt because they came from dirt. So the source from which it came will be the source from which it goes back to. So all things must. So principle number three says all things must be ma maintained by the sources from which they came. God's world re also reveals that whatever c God creates must be sustained and maintained by the source from which it came. So. You can't grow a plant in this in this ground that's in this building, right? Like if I were to put a try to put, if I were to smash a hole in this floor right here and try to grow a plant, it's not gonna grow because that's not from where it came. If I were to smash a hole into some concrete and try to put a plant in that, unless there's dirt far into that concrete, it's not gonna grow. So it's the same thing. Plants they are they come from soil, dirt. So you are not going to be able to plant or have a plant grow unless it is coming from the source first. So animals that cease to exist to eat plants or other animals, they die. Fish that are removed from the water, die. Flowers that are cut for arrangements will sooner than those that remain attached to the plant. They will also die, right? When we cut roses off plants, you know, to give people flowers, you're still killing that rose you're not it's not going to survive 
it may for a little bit when you put it in a vase, right? Because this you give it water, but without dirt and water in that vase, it will not stay living. It's just going to die being in that water. Water alone is not going to keep that plant alive. So indeed, all living things die the instant they are removed from their source. So the signs of death and decay may not be immediately evident, but nonetheless they are dead. None of God's living creatures can survive without the resources and nourishment provided by the substances from which they came. Right? right? Animals cannot survive unless they eat the very things that are on this earth that are made from the ground, right? If an animal has to eat plants to survive, if there was no plants to eat from, they would die. If there are animals that, you know, there are carnivores, they eat other animals. Without other animals that are being made for them to hunt, they would not survive because there would be nothing for them to eat. Because they wouldn't know what to eat. They would be confused. Their natural instinct of things would not be, hey, let's go eat plants. They want to go eat meat. But without the meat resource, there's no way for them to survive, right? Because that is their initial... That is their instinct. That's what they want. That's what they want, right? In principle number four, we says the potential of all things is related to the sources from which they came. So, because all things are composed of the sources from which they came, they can also contain as little or as much potential as their original substance. So, animals have no greater or lesser potential than the dirt from which they came. Plants only have only the potential of the dirt. If the soil is lacking in nutrients or the ability to hold water, the plants attached to that soil are going to adversely affect or are to be adversely affected by the poor quality of that soil. The plant may still grow, but it will have a really weird effect of growth and it will not grow properly. So likewise, the animals that eat plants that are growing in the unhealthy soil are going to receive less nutrients than if they had eaten plants that were growing in healthy soil. So that is the see like when we talk about just like just like humans, we sometimes have to find ways to eat healthier food that comes from a healthier resource than eating whatever. See, we some people have normal milk they drink all the time, and some people have almond milk they drink all the time. Almond milk is a little bit healthier source than normal milk, but doesn't mean it's going to be richer in protein. But it still doesn't mean it's still a better alternate source of healthier milk if you wanted healthier milk for that example or. If you wanted to eat green beans or you wanted to eat fries, I'm pretty sure fries aren't going to be the healthier option over green beans. Now, <laughs> but if you wanted a healthier alternative to fries, there's also, uh, what's it called? I don't know. I can't remember it all of a sudden. Sweet potato. It's not necessarily healthy, healthy, but it's still a healthier option than normal potato. But if you were to grow either of these things, right? in the wrong soil, it's not going to come out right. Would you want to, if, if I grew an apple tree and that apple tree wasn't in the right kind of soil and it grew apples that were weird, would you honestly eat that apple? Because the potential of getting sick from that apple now because it was grown in the wrong environment, in the wrong soil, or maybe it just doesn't come out right and you're looking at that apple and it looks a little pale, even though that's a fully grown apple, I don't think I'd eat that apple because that's not a healthy apple, right? So like we said, if it's not grown in healthier soil, those plants and those nutrients are not going to help those animals survive, but those plants and nutrients aren't also going to survive either. That plant has the wrong foundation. It's not growing in the right place. If I were to try, see, if, like I said, if I, if I were to break concrete, right, and I found soil in that concrete, that soil may not be the right environment for me to grow a plant. I could try, and it may grow, but it's not necessarily going to be, a plant may not survive, even if it does grow. So no product can be more powerful than the source from which it came. A wooden table is only as strong as the wood of the tree from which the furniture maker built it, right? There are, we've looked, people have done research, right? There are certain trees that are better, right? for better foundation. See, they're, they're only, I believe, I don't remember what tree is called, but I know people, when they, when they build things, they only, most people try to use a certain type of tree when they're putting wood structures into buildings because that certain tree is way stronger than other trees. It's oaks, 
Okay, well that's that's a good thing to know. <laughs> but they use that certain wood to use it as a foundation for when they're building things, right? Because it lasts longer. It's more strong. It's just tough, right? See, if you use the wrong wood, if I were to go out right now and go just go, go grab go grab some random tree that probably isn't necessarily that good and to try to build a house out of that, I'm pretty sure it will rot much faster and it will be less of support and it wouldn't be a very good foundation. So just like on a table, like this wood, I don't even know what this is, but man, this thing's been around forever. It's still standing. <laughs> but if this was any other wood, I guarantee you it probably would have fallen by now because this, this, this thing is somehow still alive. It's amazing. <laughs> it's a very solid very solid <laughs> podium <laughs> but I guarantee if this was any other wood that was not very strong wood this would probably would have deteriorated by now or fallen apart for all I know or whatever the case may be but it's not it's made out it was made out of a stronger wood so a floor made of pine will not withstand wear as well as a floor made of oak because pine is a softer wood than oak right so the characteristics of a tree from which the flooring boards were made always affect the quality of the finished floor, right? If you put the wrong wood on that floor, it's just going to rot faster than the other wood would, which <laughs> other wood would. <laughs> so no product can be more powerful than the source from which it came. So thus the quality of any product is dependent upon the quality of the components used in that product. So which is dependent upon the quality of materials used in the components. So the potential of something is always related, right, to the potential of the source from which it came. So nothing can be greater than its source. So principle number five, everything in life has the potential to fulfill its purpose. The purpose of a thing is the original intent or desire of the one who created it. So the purpose of a thing cannot be known by asking anyone other than the designer or the manufacturer, right? So for us to understand who we are, we go to our source, we go to our manufacturer, our creator, because if we didn't go to God, how do we know what it means to live out the potential we have or to even be healthy sometimes, you know? God helps us to figure out ways to be healthier, but you know, it doesn't mean we're always being healthier. And some people go to fast food every day or they eat other things like every single day. I'm working on that. <laughs> but it's kind of hard when you're going to work and the only food options they have is horrible. So, <laughs> but it doesn't mean I still can't figure out a way to be healthier. But it's the same thing. If I were to go to, thus, if I were to go to my source, I would go to God to figure out, hey, God, what would I need to do to change my diet? Or what would I need to do to change my health? Or, what do I need to do to further myself? How to strengthen myself? What do I need to do? Right? So if we enter the laboratory of an inventor who asked what a certain contraption was supposed to do, you might guess at what service or function it could perform, but only the inventor would be able to confirm or reject your suggestion. Right? If I were to say, hey, person who created the chair, if I were to go, hey, you know what, this is the first time I've ever seen one of these before. What's the purpose of this? Is it, is it for throwing? Mm, uh, the creator might be like, I don't know. I mean, maybe. And you're like, well, is it, is, it for, is it for something else? Do I use it for this or do I use it for that? Like, do I use it to put books on it, to, you know, to like read on? And only your <laughs> – but only, only the creator can say what its real purpose is. See, he might – confirm like he said you might confirm or reject your suggestion so for all those things i might say say you know what you you could maybe use them for those things you could throw the chair if you want to throw the chair it's not necessarily the purpose of why i created it but you know if you wanted to throw the chair go ahead doesn't mean that's the purpose though so then you ask him what is that purpose and he says well the purpose of that thing is for you to sit on it for you to be able to relax have somewhere to sit down right or to sit down when you're studying or whatever the case may be so the purpose of a thing cannot be known by asking anyone other than the designer so likewise the ability of that product to fulfill its purpose is designed into the product right 
So the purpose and design of the chair may not be to be thrown or to be read on or whatever the case may be or to be beaten up for whatever reason you want to beat up a chair or th whatever the reason may be. The purpose of a chair is not that. The purpose of a chair is to be sat in, right? So no manufacturer would suggest that you use his appliance to wash clothes. I mean, you're not going to use a chair to wash clothes, are you? That'd be a little odd. I mean, you could, you know, throw your dried clothes over it if you really want, or your wet clothes over it out in the sun if you wanted to and let it dry. It may not be the best option, but it's totally up to you. But that's not the intention. <laughs> right? So, if I assume that the machine is a clothes dryer and complain to the dealer that the machine won't dry my clothes, and the manufacturer, you know, will most likely certainly respond, but that machine isn't supposed to dry clothes, use it to wash clothes, and it'll work fine. So, like, this is, you know, obviously this is for example of a washer and dryer. If I were to put clothes into the washer and it doesn't dry and you complain that it doesn't dry, that would be weird because it's meant to wash. It's meant to be wet on purpose. If there's water that's in the washer on purpose to get the clothes wet, right? So you have to use it to wash clothes and it will work perfectly fine. But don't ask it to dry clothes because it can't. Just like I can't ask this chair to dry clothes, there's no way it can. I can't ask the chair to throw itself because it can't. Right? What? <laughs> but the manufacturer determines both the product's purpose and how it will function to fulfill that purpose. Just like we talk about how, it's like when we say in the dryer is meant to dry and the washer is meant to wash and the chair is meant to be sat on and the pulpit is used for books to be laid upon to preach behind it or to teach behind it, right? Everything has a plan, a purpose, or a reason for it to be used. So... Like I said, I'm not going to throw the chair, or I'm, and I'm not going to use the washer to dry clothes. I'm going to use it for its intended purpose. Principle number six, it says potential is determined and revealed by the demand placed on it by its creator. So what a product can potentially do is determined by what the manufacturer of the product asks. So potential is revealed by the faith of the manufacturer and his product and expectation he places on it, right? So if the creator of small trucks designs them to carry one half ton, the company will not advertise their product has the ability to carry one ton, right? Because then you're, you're falsely advertising what your product is meant to do, which people do. There are p plenty of advertisements we see nowadays that will falsely advertise what something can do and we know that's not true. But if a small truck were to be designed and says it holds one half ton, you're not going to try to put a ton of stuff on there, are you? A ton's worth of weight. If you put a ton's worth of weight on that truck, it's not going to work very well because then you're using it for something it's not intended for. So why? Because the manufacturer knows that he cannot carry the require cannot require the truck to carry a full ton of things when the specifications under which it was built designated that maximum capacity is only one half ton. So. The creator intended his product and expectation that he places upon this product were set for a certain standard. So that thing he set it for is what it is limited to, right? So if it was intended to carry one ton, it would carry one ton. But it was not intended to carry the one ton. So if you put a ton of weight on that vehicle, it's not going to work properly because it cannot carry that weight. So the manufacturer will not ask the product to perform more or less than he has designed. If a manufacturer requires a product to do something, you can be sure that he believes the ability to perform the task was built into that product, right? So now we're getting into the keys of releasing your potential. Building potential into a product does not necessarily mean that potential will be revealed. Many of us have appliances in our homes that are capable of much more than we require of them. Perhaps you use your oven to bake but not broil because you have because you have a vacuum cleaner that has the ability to clean up water as well as dirt. Right? So, exactly. I, can you say self-help is a great example. There's so much on this stuff that you can do. Maybe too much. Honestly, there is too much. Kids are sapped into their phones daily way too many things that do on this phone that they really don't need to and is it any help no 
it's it's not really any help at all. There are so many things that you can do on your phone that are completely unnecessary, that make no sense and have no reason sometimes. People will download a million games on their phones and sit there and play on those games all day at work and be distracted by their phone all day. And I will admit, I do use my phone for a lot of things too, but because of work now, I mainly use my phone for work. I have taken... I can't even say, I've probably taken, if I go to my deleted photos, because of how many photos I've taken at work, I have over 5,000 deleted photos. Be I have never taken, I literally only have probably like 200 photos on my phone total. I never take photos for things ever. But I have, I'm using my phone for, you know, it takes photos. It's an, that's the purpose, you can take photos with the phone, and the intended purpose behind that phone is to be able to use it for other things. So I'm using apps, websites, online things. I'm using my photos to take photos of cars, different stuff I do at my work. So I'm using it fully to the intention that it is and can be capable of using, but it doesn't mean that there still isn't too much on this phone that it can be used. Sometimes it's still excessive. So just like, you know, when you bake things, it may not be able to broil, or when you have a vacuum cleaner that has the ability to clean up water as well as dirt, and you haven't used that feature because you aren't aware that the manufacturer built the capability into that machine, then you're not going to, it's just something that's kind of excessive, you don't realize it, right? Whoa. What just happened? Yikes. Okay. But God has built many possibilities into men and women. Too often, however, we fail to use that potential because we don't understand the magnitude or the capability or the requirement that are necessary to unleash our potential, right? To unleash that power. So we go to key number one. You must know your source. Every product you purchase includes a certain degree of guarantee based on relationship with the one from whom you bought the product, right? So if you want to buy a car, you will search, you will research the integrity of the various car manufacturers and quality of their cars, right? That's right. Right? I, I, I have a very nice car. My Toyota, I think, is amazing. It has no issues whatsoever. And that's not because I'm, you know, I'm not advertising Toyota, obviously, but, like, I just love my car. I think it's a great car. It's reliable. It gets me where I need to go. And it has no issues, and it's a lot cheaper. It's a reliable car, but that for me, I had to do research and talk to, at the time, my roommate still, but not my roommate now. I had to talk to him at the time and say, hey, man, I, like, I was, when I was looking for a car, we did research, we looked into things, what cars are more reliable, what, what could I get? And because they had that car, I wanted that car because I realized that car, after the various research I did for that product, was more efficient and had the things that I needed and it, it's, it's a very simple car it doesn't have overabundant there are some vehicles that have way too much in them in my opinion they have USBs plugged in, in the back seat this seat that seat it's got this thing a DVD player it's got this it's got that feature it's got heated seats in the back row and the third row it's got this it's got that there are some cars that just have way too much in them in my opinion and they don't need all that so that's why that car has everything it needs to have. It doesn't need anything else. But God is your manufacturer. So if you want to know your potential, you must go to him. So for me to figure out what all God has built, I mean, if I, all the products that are in my car, the manufacturer built, if I were to say, God, if I were to take all that and I want you to show me that's who I am, I want all those things built in me in a sense, I want you to just show me all of these features that I'm capable of doing, all these things I'm capable of doing. Because God has authorized us through the Holy Spirit, right, that we can reveal to others these qualities and these characteristics, but also reveal to us these qualities and characteristics of our potential, yeah. right? So unless you get to know your source and establish a relationship through him, his son, Jesus, right, you have no hope of releasing this potential, so knowing God is the foundational key upon which all their keys are set. Right? Key number two, you must understand how you were designed to function. Right? 
you must understand what you are designed to function. Every manufacturer designs his product with a certain feature and specification. Then he gives you an instruction book that clarifies the definitions of the features that you can become familiar with, both the parts of the equipment and their functions. So, if a car manufacturer describes in a manual how the engine, brakes, windshield wipers, etc. are supposed to operate, because he knows, right, that you will not get, um, you will not get the, the most optimum, or no, you, it will not perform the best of its ability, unless you know, you know, from that car, unless you understand how the various things work, you will not under, you will not fully understand the performance that the car is intended for, unless you figure it out right the manual is there for you to understand how these functions work so if you're a person that has never been in a car for some reason before or you've never driven a car or you've never even understood how a car works perfect man you have a manual that literally in detail tells you what every indicator means what light what lights mean what when if a car has issues what this light means, what that light means, what this button, what that button is functional for, what this button is functional for, what this means, or how the brake works, how the gas works, how the steering works, right? That manual literally goes into detail. So if you really don't know how the car works, you have an entire manual to fully tell you how it works. So God designed you with intricate features and capabilities. If you fail to learn from God how you were designed to function, right, you are on your way to short circuiting you will never release your potential unless you learn to function by the faith according to God's specifications right <laughs> there um there's still quite a lot uh I probably don't want to go for too much longer but um what <laughs> but in key number three it says you must know your purpose so when a manufacturer proposes a new product he first clarifies the purpose right of what the product's intended for just like how we say if a microwave is intended for cooking food that's the intended purpose of the microwave so then he designs the features to accomplish his intent. So therefore, like we've been talking about, car manufacturer will decide whether or not the vehicle is to be a race car, delivery van, or a family car. Most people, they say vans, right, are meant for being like more of a family car. Most people say that a Corvette, right, would be more of a sports car, not much of a travel car. It could also be used as a race car if you really wanted to. You probably shouldn't, but you could. <laughs> <laughs> But once the vehicle's purpose has been established, the engineer will incorporate various features to meet the purpose that it has. So before you were born, God had a plan and a purpose for your life. So then in accordance with this plan, he gave you special abilities and aptitudes to enable right, you to accomplish everything that he intended. So if you are going to release your potential, you must first discover God's plan for your life knowing and living within God's purpose is the difference between using and abusing the gifts and capabilities God has built into you knowing and living see people abuse and use their gifts and capabilities for the wrong intention for the wrong meaning they're not using it for God they're not using it for their creator they're using it for other means so yeah some people are still very successful by doing these things and because they, they're gifts and they're the things they use and the things they're doing right are still there and the capability of all those things is there but it doesn't mean they're really living and knowing who God is and God's purpose for them they're just abusing the gifts that God has given them already King number four says you must understand your resources so manufacturers also determine the resource that are necessary for a product to perform correctly and efficiently. So a car manufacturer might specify the octane of gasoline to be used, the, pres the pressure of the air and the tires, the weight of the oil for the engine. So God's pattern for your life also includes specifications for the spirit, 
for your physical, material, and soul resources that are necessary for you to live a fulfilling and productive life. So until you learn what resources God has arranged for you to enjoy and what benefits he planned for you to receive from each source, your potential will be stunted and your performance will be less than it, are, than it could possibly be, right? God tells you to read the Bible. He tells you to stay in his word daily. He tells you to stay in the Holy Spirit. He wants you to pray with him, right? So in order for you to maintain yourself, you must understand what it means to be in line with God in the spirit, be in line with God with your soul, right? And when those things are in line with God, the physical means and the material means will come along with it easily, right? Because these resources, they're the things that we eat, the way we live, the stuff that we have, how we decide to live with these things that we do have, right? The material things, the physical things, those things are just extra things that come along with the resources that God has given us because the spirit, right, is the main source for what God wants us to live off of. And when we can tap into the Holy Spirit and we can have that relationship building in God, right, it's easy for us to get these material or physical things that need to keep us alive to fulfill the plan and destiny and purpose that God has for us, right? Money and all these things are just material things. But in order for us to accomplish things in God, sometimes God will say, all right, because you are staying in the Holy Spirit, because you're tapping into the source, because you are aligned with me, right? These things I will give to you to help live and fulfill your life on earth, right? Key number five says you must have the right environment. Product engineers consider carefully both the ideal environment under which a product should operate and any unfavorable conditions that might influence the product's performance. While a car manufacturer might establish right the ideal conditions on a sunny day with temperatures between 32 and 70 degrees, the engineer must also plan for rainy days, fog, new moon nights, freezing, or sweltering temperatures. So when God created human beings, he placed them in the Garden of Eden where ideal conditions for man's growth and fulfillment were present. When sin entered the world through Adam and Eve's disobedience, man's environment became polluted. See, Adam and Eve had the perfect environment. I guarantee there was no cold days. It was always a perfect, nice, breezy, sunny temperature. Did you say 90 degrees? I was going to say, oh my gosh, that's horrible. <laughs> but yeah, I would say, I would say like, you know, 73 to 79 is great because that's like perfect. I'm like, you know, if it's a breezy day, 79. But I would say right there is great temperature because, and I guarantee this kind of temperature they probably had for all we know. Who knows? You know what I mean? But they had the perfect environment. They didn't even need clothes, remember? They didn't even realize they were naked. They were in a garden. That was perfect for their environment, right? So when they entered, when they did disobey, when they entered into sin, our environment became polluted. So most men and women are not aware of the nature of this, right? They're not nature. Of, they're not aware of this proliferation or pollutants or the things that have invaded the environment. So the release of your potential requires both a knowledge of specifications of the ideal environment that God provided in the Garden of Eden and a willingness to make necessary changes to perform and conform your surroundings to God's specifications. See, we talk about the right people, right? Because sometimes if they're in your life, it will create the right environment. But if you have the wrong people in your life, it will create the wrong environment. Things will pollute your environment if you have the wrong people around you. Things will not further progress if the wrong people in the wrong environment are around you. So in order for you to have the right specifications, the right environment, you must first reach to God as your source and figure out what God's version or what God wants around you to create the right environment for you to fully tap into that potential. Key number six says you must work out your potential. Most products do not achieve their purpose just by virtue of their existence. They have to do something to meet the expectations of their manufacturer. 
A car, for example, must transport its occupants from cargo point A to point B. So, thus, its purpose cannot be fulfilled by sitting in the driveway, right, and doing nothing. If you, if I had a car, and I always asked, and I was always asking someone else to take me to work, or I was always paying for an Uber or whatever, or a taxi to take me to work. My car is just going to sit in that driveway with me doing nothing about it. My car's intended purpose is to not sit in that driveway to do nothing. My car's intended purpose is for me to be able to drive around, to travel maybe, or to get, or just to get to work and back. Or maybe I just want to leave the house to go grab some food or whatever the case may be. Or maybe I want to take a road trip and drive all the way to South Carolina, whatever the reason may be, or to Florida, or to mainly Colorado would be nice. <laughs> But the intended purpose of the car is not to sit around, right? The potential is to fulfill its purpose is present while it sits in the driveway, but the actual achievement of the manufacturer's intent occurs when the car does what it's designed to do, which is drive, right? To go. So God plays Adam in an ideal environment where all the necessary resources for a productive and satisfying life were there. So Adam enjoyed an intimate relationship with God in which the nature of God, the manner in which God functioned, and the purpose for which God had created man were known to Adam. So Adam had that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. Adam had the, the potential to do everything he was intended perfectly because of the environment he had and where he was at and the fact that he had that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, the fact that he was there in person with God all the time, Right? But Adam's potential would have remained locked inside him if God had not given him a job to do. So only through work was Adam's potential to name the animals revealed. The same is true for us. Your potential will not be released until you take your thoughts and plans and imaginations and put them into work first. Put them into action. You must work to understand your hidden potential, right? Just like... Like I said, if that car was sitting around all the time, I would never know the true intention or the purpose or how much potential the car had. See, for all I know, if I, if I never drove that car, I never touched my car, I wouldn't know if it could go past 200,000 miles or I don't know if it could go 300,000 miles. Whatever the case may be, I have no idea how long the vehicle would last unless I use it for the intended purpose it's made for first, right? So it's the same thing. God put out of the work. For him to understand how great his potential was, Adam found out that he was capable of naming everything. He named every insect, every animal, every living creature, right? He was able to name everything because God gave him the assignment to do that, and he was able to think of all these names. Dude, I would have never, who would have thought a lion was called a lion, dude? That wouldn't have popped up in my head unless it was taught to me, you know what I mean? We learn about creatures and what their names are throughout history and science. And what things are throughout history and science too, right? Through the vast majority of all these years that I've gone through life, we learn these things because other people wrote them down. But Adam had to name all these things and figure out all these things and do all these things by putting in the work and effort. And he did it because God gave him the ability to do that. Which means God's given us, God give, our ability that we have, what we have in God is amazing. It's so great. It's crazy. But, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop. And there's, there's still 